While on a European vacation, Joseph Cusero was struck by the realization of how important the acoustic properties of a space were to the success of a musical composition. About 20 years ago, I went to Europe and went to the Köln Cathedral in Germany. And that was one of the cathedrals that Bach was a composer at. And I heard Bach's music in the room on the organ that he composed it. And I completely got it. I completely understood why the music was the way it was. And it's the composer playing on a specific instrument, writing music for a specific instrument, for a specific space. And that's exactly what we're doing. When uh, Professor Reynolds creates a work, we visit the space. He explains his concept to this group of, of um, technicians or fellow collaborators that work with him. And he chooses those collaborators for very specific reasons because we have the expertise that will assist him in realizing what he wants to accomplish. We try and analyze what all the problems might be, what all the attributes of this space are, and then we kind of make a list and figure out what it is we want to take advantage of in the space and what it is we need to mitigate or what the problems are that we're going to need to overcome. On a site visit to the Kennedy Center, Joseph made a very specialized recording. Um, they're called impulse responses and those sound files then go into this program and that becomes what's called an impulse response reverberator. We're using that technology to model this special concert hall. Even though they are working 3,000 miles from the performance location, the impulse response emulator makes this small rehearsal stage in San Diego sound like the enormous concert hall at the Kennedy Center. This allows the production team to hear their work as if they were sitting in the Kennedy Center audience. I prepared a fake orchestra so that the actors could rehearse with each other and, uh, and Ross could know sort of how the music would unfold in, in, and, and work his video accordingly and I could work my own sounds with that too. So it was a very long process of creating the illusion that we were working with an orchestra. I think one thing we've realized while working is that it's difficult to make speedy progress because each element is dependent on the other. So when we make a, a, some progress in the synthesis of the audio, then I have to go through into the video and make uh, changes and then we learn some new things from the video and then we have to make changes to the sound design and this kind of incremental process is it, the result is that it's a very tightly um, interactive experience and I think it does create a synesthetic response and and it's it's hard to detach the music from the visuals and vice versa so at times I think the audience will feel like the music is uh, on, on one level a cinematic soundtrack and then on the other level that the images are an environment in which these sounds exist. So it, it, it works in both directions, absolutely. It's changed so radically. Mm -hmm. And it's strange because I realized that, uh, I realized that I was seeing a kind of pictorial surface before and now I'm feeling a world of visual relationships. You know, That's good. It's, it's really, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really amazing. Math and technology are critical to the creative process. When I studied in high school and I was uh, learning about uh, sine waves and, or just to know the, like, the trigonometrical property of what is a sine of an angle. And uh, I really was not very interested. <laughs> Um, and now it's the first thing I teach when I teach how to make sound with a computer. It is uh, at the center of a lot of, of theories on how sound works and, and it's a great element in making sounds with a computer. 
Uh, the same with matrices. I, th I never thought that they would be useful in my life. I thought, why are they making me learn this thing? And uh, because I wanted to be a musician and I didn't really think that I would need this. And now actually a lot of the stuff that I learned in music has been less useful to me than the stuff that I use every day, which is based on math. If you at least have a very good understanding of math, that allows you to understand what's going on with acoustics, which is how sound moves within a space. It will give you a reasonable you know, stepping stone into computer programming. And since just about everything is computer driven now, if a computer doesn't do something that you want it to do, then there are lots of programs that are readily available. Um, that allow you to create your own program to do specifically what you want to do. The most important thing that I learned from music was the sensibility to listen and to pay attention and to be in the sound. But to make these sounds, you need to know what sound is and how to transform it and how to capture it and how to mold it like clay and transform it and another really wonderful metaphor is how do you use these elements like in chemistry and make this new alloy this new sound that is not any of the sounds that you hear in the orchestra or any of the sounds that you hear from natural sources this is another w sound world and it, it has become more and more important for me to reflect on that relationship of how you make technology be musical. I do not subscribe to the idea that you're inspired or that, you know, some divine situation happens and, and then you're inspired and you write something. I do not uh, think that one works in the abstract, but rather than one that one develops the ability to find something that is interesting and explore. And it's in that process of exploration that you discover. And creativity is not creating something out of nothing. It's, it's more your ability to find something by transforming it, by looking at it in a different angle, from a different light. And those things are really the ones that matter a lot. The very beginning of this work begins with harpsichord music, which could actually have been heard by Washington in Mount Vernon. But then the computer begins to transform that sound to smear it out over time, to change its character without losing at another level its identity. These, these kinds of transformations of the imagined into the experienced, that's something new. To be a little more the actor performances are rehearsed to the same level of artistic nuance as the other elements of the production. Yeah, so I'll start with the, the GW3. Yeah, I'll yeah, on not page on two. page two, right? Yeah. Okay. I retain an unalterable affection for you, which neither time nor distance can change. And neither time nor distance, distance can, can change. 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 Okay. It's sort of like, like a tam tam. <laughs> it's just things. So, I retain an unalterable affection for you. For you. For you, For you, right, yeah. which neither time nor distance can change. Yes, there you go. An unalterable affection for you. Yeah. Which neither time nor distance can change. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I think the, the initial impact of this piece is in the text that Roger has pulled from Washington's diary entries and letters. Um, so as, as I'm walking around the state, I sort of have the recitation of that sound in my head of, of his texts. And walking around the estate, you could see a tree and it would have absolutely 
um, different meaning than just a tree on the historical landmark of Mount Vernon, but instead would also have this context of Washington's own text to, uh, to frame it. Um, so that changed my perspective of the, um, of, of, the, of the estate. And I think these images and that text for the audience at the Kennedy Center, it'll have the same sort of impact that they'll, they'll see an image that is authentic, it's from the estate, it's from, a, from an artifact that Washington drew or, or wrote, uh, and they'll hear his own text. And the goal of, of the combination of these elements is to cast a little bit more emotion and meaning onto um, what would other, otherwise be historical artifacts. It was crucial to us from the beginning that all the levels of this work, the ideas expressed, the voices heard, the orchestral music, the images moving, the computer transformations of natural sound and so on, would all be interactive and at some kind of parody so that they never contradict each other they never interfere with each other. They're always flowing in support of one another. So if you are at a performance of this work and you are thinking only of the sights or only of the words or only of the sounds, then you're missing something. Because the desire on my part is that this becomes a kind of amalgam, which pulls everything in our capacity to feel, to understand, to experience, and puts it all at the service of one multifaceted vision. I see their situation, know their danger, without having it in my power to give them further relief. intellectual light will spring up in the dark corners of the earth, that freedom of inquiry will produce liberality of conduct, that mankind will reverse the absurd position that the many were made for the few.